the, the invitation to speak here. Uh, and um, so I'm going to be speaking about joint work with a number of people in different parts of it. We're done with other people. So, uh, so I want to universality aspect of numerical computation. And this is work done with Christian Frang and Govind Menon. Menon. Also uh, with Tom Trogdon, who is here, and also with Sheehan Olver. So different parts have been done. So the situation I'd like you to think about is suppose you've got some system that's short like this, and you want to analyze the system. The system has some stochastic elements. For example, the data for the problem are not perfectly specified. So you want to come up with some probabilistic model. And then you face two questions, which basic questions to every statistician. Okay. First one is, how do I choose? Choose my ensemble. And to what extent does it matter? So in particular, I'm thinking I should ask you to have in mind questions of universality. There we see we're all familiar with the idea that many phenomena connected with ra random matrix theory are universal. So the idea is, in a more general con uh, uh, context, do we see similar phenomena? So to be more concrete, the kind of problem which I want to look at are different specific problems in numerical analysis. Uh, let me say right in the beginning that you won't see a single theorem. Um, all of this is numerical com uh, computation. Uh, and I just ask people to, uh, who've seen parts of this talk before to just bear, bear with me. There will be some new things here. So I'm particularly going to focus on two problems. This is computing the eigenvalues of a random n by n real symmetric matrix, typically we write such matrices M with components M i j, and secondly solving basic linear algebra which is A u equals B, and A is a random matrix or operator. So that's the context in which uh, I want to talk. So initially I want to focus on the eigenvalue problem. Now thanks a lot. Now, uh, the, uh, all software algorithms have the following feature. So you go, you look at lin, LinPack or anything like this, they all have the following feature. You want, there's some matrix M0, you want to know what its eigenvalues are. So there exists an algorithm which is a map taking matrices to matrices, symmetric matrices to symmetric matrices, 
and you define mk plus 1 as being phi of mk where m0 is given to you. This is k big or equal to 0. And this map has two important properties. Is that the spectrum of m is the spectrum of phi m. So it's an isospectral map. The other feature it has is mk converges to a diagonal lambda 1, lambda n, as k goes to infinity. Necessarily, by this property here, what appears in the diagonal must be the eigenvalues of your original matrix. So this very elegant idea, which one would initially think as some mathematician would have thought, thought up as a possibility, is what actually works, and is what actually has done. So I'm going to describe different algorithms. So, all right. so to have a specific uh, problem to compute or to analyze, I want to introduce this notion from numerical analysis called deflation. So if you have a matrix M, which can be decomposed in block form, so this is going to be K by K, this is going to be K by N minus K, and we consider M hat, which is just the diagonal blocks, this has eigenvalues lambda K, this has eigenvalues lambda k hat. And if the norm of m12 is less than epsilon, it's a simple piece of analysis to show that lambda k hat is going to be less than or equal to epsilon in that way. So what that means is if you start off with a matrix MK, M, and you go to your sequence MK, and at some point you find that MK12 has a norm less than epsilon for some such decomposition, then it means that if you just drop the off-diagonal entries, you can now look at a small, smaller problem and you haven't lost your eigenvalues to more than order epsilon. So this idea of de deflating is very, very fun fundamental in the co computation of eigenvalues. If you have an algorithm, for example, which splits you in two or, or all the time, and you're working in par parallel, which is the way to go, then you see that the amount of time that you need or the number of steps you need to deflate to order epsilon will just be multiplied by a factor, typically a log n type factor, to be able to compute all the eigenvalues within epsilon. So deflation to a time epsilon is a good measure. Time to deflation of order epsilon is a good measure. of the performance of an algorithm. And that's the statistic we're going to work with, the time to deflation of order epsilon. Yeah, this K is different, sorry, this is, this is a bad, this k and that k are not the same, right? This k and that k is the same. So, for any block, for any block, any, in, you if you find no, no, you look at all blocks, and if a block emerges, then that's where you cut the matrix. Right. And you can determine the statistics. You can look at the statistics of whether cutting is taking place. Now, uh, all right. 
So I'm going to consider four different algorithms. So algorithms. One is the QR algorithm, which is the most fa famous and probably the most successful numerical algorithm there is. The next one is QR with shifts. And QR with shifts is the actual practical implication, implementation of the Q, QR algorithm. I'm getting there. Okay. The next is the so-called TODA algorithm. And the fourth one is the Jacobi algorithm. Just want to say a word about the Jacobi al uh, algorithm. Some Something momentous occurred about two or three or maybe four years ago in the uh, theory of com computation. And that was a point at which manufacturers apparently le reached the practical limit in terms of what size you can make a chip. Any smaller would make the chip unstable. It generates too, too much heat. So this meant that pe people who are writing codes had to rethink everything they were doing, people like Jim, Jim Demel, and they began to rewrite all, all the codes using divide and conquer type ideas, which are of, uh, of this type. And it turned out that the Jacobi algorithm is much more suited than many other algorithms to that pro pros. You get, a, you get a lot of accuracy, you get eigenvector information. So it's an algorithm which is increasingly in use. And I'm going to describe now what, how these algorithms work. So the first one is just very, very elegant algorithm. So here is your matrix M0 whose eigenvalues you want. So you take your matrix M0, and let's assume that M0 has, is non-singular, non and you factorize it as Q times R. So Q0 is orthogonal. R0 is upper triangular, and R0ii are positive. So if you think about it, that means that the first column of Q0 is just a multiple of the first column of, uh, of M M0. The second column of Q Q's has come combination of the two columns of this. So all you're doing is Gram-Schmidt starting from the left. You then define M1 to be R0, Q0. It's your definition. And that's just equal to Q0 transpose Q0, R0, Q0, because this is the identity, and this is M0. So you see that M1 is a matrix with exactly the same spectrum as M0. It's orthogonally e uh, equivalent to, to, uh, to it. Now, your matrix M1 also has its own QR factorization. So you then define M2 to be R1, Q1. And in this way, you get a sequence of uh, orthogonally equivalent matrices. In other words, all with the same spectrum. And under appropriate conditions, MK will go to a diagonal matrix whose entries are necessarily the eigenvalues. So, so this very elegant set of thoughts really, really works well. And for example, a con uh, condition you might uh, have is that lambda J is not equal to lambda K or J not equal to K. That will be a condition under which the algorithm works. So the so this is one algorithm, this very elegant algorithm. As we'll see, it's quite extraordinary that this very practical algorithm has immense mathematical structure, uh, really immense. We'll, we'll say a little bit more about it. I just want to say something now about QR with shifts. When you analyze what's going on here, you see what's important is inverse power iteration. In other words, the performance of this algorithm is connected with doing the following. 
you look at your original matrix and you raise it to minus the power k and you let it act on the vector en, in other words, 0, 0, 0, 1. So if m0 is O lambda O transpose, as its spectral de decomposition, this is equal to O uh, lambda 1 to the minus 1, lambda n to the minus 1, O to the minus k, minus k, O e n. And you see that if one of these eigenvalues is much smaller than the others, it's going to rapidly dominate in terms of the behavior of, uh, of this matrix. So you'll just pull out one, one term. So then there's this beautiful idea, extraordinary that it works, is that if I now shift the matrix in some appropriate way, then instead of having this over here, I would have lambda i minus sigma to the minus k. And if sigma is chosen that it's very close to one of the eigenvalues, this is going to speed up the algorithm enormously. So there's something known as the Wilkinson shift, which is a rational procedure which tells you how to choose sigma so you can speed up the, uh, the, the algorithm. So QR then is uh, you make a choice of sigma, you run a few iterates, make a new choice of sigma, run a few, few, a few, a few iterates. So it's sort of a, a kicked version of Q, QR. All right. Now, I'm um, going to speak about uh, the to TODA algorithm a little bit later. But I'll just say something about the um, Jacobi algorithm. Again, it's immensely simple. And it's, again, it's remarkable that it works so well. Suppose I've got a matrix M. And it has these entries. And let me look at, say, the 1, 2 entry could be the ij n entry, not on diagonal. And suppose this is maximal. In other words, from all the off-diagonal entries, this is a maximal one. Then what you do is you go to a new, new matrix M prime, which is obtained by taking a little two by two rotation. So Q looks like this cosine sine like this, and you choose the rotation in such a way that there is a zero here. In other words, you just kill the biggest guy. And you keep doing this. The wonderful thing is that this con con converges. It's not a priori clear that it con uh, converges. And because each action is an isospectral action, what uh, the matrix will converge to a di diagonal form. What appears in the, 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 the diagonal is um, the eigenvalues of the original matrix. So these, these are the things if you buy any soft software, you're going to see one of these algorithms operating. Okay, so I want to say a little bit about the structure of the QQR algorithm and how it fits into a family of algorithms, one of which is the TODA algorithm. So this is going to be some Hamiltonian theory. And it goes like this. So the message I want to get across here is that eigenvalue algorithms, eigenvalue algorithms, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with completely integrable Hamiltonian vector fields or Hamiltonian systems. So I always regard it as really remarkable that this very practical algorithm which you do is, in fact, intimately related to completely integral Hamiltonian systems. So let Sn be the set of n by n real symmetric matrices, which we write M. Now the key observation is that this is equal to the dual Lie algebra 
of the lower triangular group. And as such, any dual Lie algebra carries a natural Poisson structure, uh, the Lie Poisson structure. So this is a Poisson manifold. So there's a <coughs> Poisson bracket which satisfies the Jacobi identity. It's a, de a degenerate uh, Poisson structure. And by general theory, that means that the entire set of real symmetric matrices can be foliated by symplectic leaves. It's not a smooth foliation, but it can be foli uh, foliated. So that means you can, if you start on one of those leaves, you stay on those leaves, and your flow, what you're looking at, uh, uh, can be, will be, have a Hamiltonian chara character. So the minimal dimensional, so minimal dimension leaf is just the Jacobi matrices. J equals A1, AN, B1, BN minus 1, B1 to BN minus 1. With, uh, let's, uh, the trace of J is 0. So this is a 2N minus 2 dimensional symplectic manifold. So you restrict your Poisson manifold to these. The generic or generic leaf consists of full, full matrices and the dimension is 2 times n squared over 4 integer part. Okay, so we have that. Okay, now... A distinguished class of Hamiltonians look like this. So let g of x be a function from r to r. And you introduce a Hamiltonian hg, which is the trace of g of m. h of g of m is a Hamiltonian on the space of matrices. g of m is obtained by the functional cal calculus. So for example, of g of x is a half x squared hg of m, which is one half the trace of m squared, for example. Now these Hamiltonians all turn out to be, uh, they give rise to flows which are com completely integrable. So I want to say a little bit about that. The, first of all, the flow that it generates has the following character. So it gives rise to flow mg of t with initial conditions at time equal to some given matrix. So this Hamiltonian, with the restriction of the, uh, uh, this Hamiltonian restricted to a sim symplectic leaf is going to generate a flow, which has the following form, dg by dmg by dt equals pi of g of mg mg is a commutator, and pi of any matrix is just you take its upper part minus the transpose of its upper part. So if A was the matrix A, B, C, D, then pi of A is just 0, 0, B minus B. Pi of A. And little g of x is just g prime. So for example, if we took g to be x squared over 2, then we'd be looking at dm by dt is just pi of m. Yeah. These are the flows. Now it's obvious from here, because of the fact that you're looking at a, comm a commutator, that the flow is isospectral. Any lax pair form tells you that the eigenvalues of the matrix are going to be con con conserved. So that means you get n integrals. But you need, in general, n squared over 4 minus n additional integrals for this to be integral. But this is a side issue. I just want to mention it.
Now, these flows have really wonderful properties. Okay. So, uh, before I do that, just let me make the point that if I do take G, let me call it GT for Toda, just to be actually half x squared, in the flow generated by this GT on the minimal uh, leaf is just the total version in Flushka Flushka Monokov variables. So just a word about that. We all know that the Famous to total lattice are n particles on the line interacting with exponential forces. There's a chain change of variables introduced by Flushkin and independently by Vamanikov, which converts that problem into exactly these equations restricted to Jacobi matrices. So, in other words, G equals x, one half x squared is just what we would call the total flow which is the flow, and there's no reason why we can't let it act, why the flow or this ha Hamiltonian act on full, full matrices. So that's the generalization of the uh, classical to, uh, to the system. Okay, now what are the properties of this? The first one is, is of course, it's isospectral. That we know. But more than that, it's completely integrable. I just mentioned on the side, the very interesting open issue in numerical analysis here is to actually use the completely integrable structure to improve the performance of, of and that is still not clear. Secondly, is that there is a stroboscope property. And all these flows uh, have this property. I'll illustrate it with the case of QR. Now, it turn, turns out that the following is true. That if you take for a Hamiltonian, which I'm going to call HQR of M, to be the trace of G of QR of M, where GQR of X is X log X minus X. You take that particular choice. And I look at the flow generated by, by this Hamiltonian, and I call it M. QRT with initial condition M0. Then the following is true. If I take this flow at integer times, that's exactly the kth iterate of the QR algorithm. So I'm saying two do two different things. One thing is start with M0 and do your QR steps, this flipping that we talked about in the beginning. The other thing you do is you take this Hamiltonian flow and you obtain the solution. So it's a stroboscope property in the following sense. You let the continuum system evolve in time in some big box. You don't look at it except every second, precisely at every second, you turn on the light. And what you see are exactly the iterates of the QR, QR algorithm. Marvelous property. And each of these flows for each choice of G have some version of the stroboscope property. Then the next fact is that if uh, G of X, or if, uh, or if G of X is monotone, then MQR of t will converge to a diagonal, or this will be true for general flows. Mg, so for a general flow, remember g is g prime. If this is monotone, then this is going to converge to a diagonal matrix. So any choice of g for which g prime is positive is an algorithm. You can, and you have a choice of solving the algorithm in two distinct ways. Either to put it in this box and run the ODE, or 
you use a stro stroboscope, pro probably, which tells you how to evaluate the problem at I integer times. Some algorithms you will want to do by the iterative procedure. Others you will want to solve the LDE. The two extremes would be TODA, the TODA algorithm. So by the TODA algorithm, we obviously mean choose G to be 1 half x squared. TODA algorithm you're going to solve as an ODE. So you're going to write down that equation which we have there and just solve it. And after a long enough time, you'll find that the matrix goes di diagonal. The QR algorithm, you don't solve as an ODE. You solve it using the, stro the stroboscope property. And I should say right in the beginning, we're really looking at the choice of in engineering here. Is you want to choose G in a way which you think is appropriate for the particular matrix which you have at hand. How you actually do that is a matter. Yeah. So uh, I'm maybe missed this, but the convergence of a discrete algorithm doesn't imply anything for the convergence of a flow. Or no, versa? it's just the con convergence of the discrete algorithm is a manifestation of the convergence of the con con continuum so process. The flow goes to fixed points. Yeah, yeah. Not just at integer times. Okay. Do you have to worry about when you have eigenvalues that are very close? Or it, it's all part to, so we're going to put this whole thing now into a statistical frame, uh, framework, and so the question to what that arises is certainly going to affect performance. Okay. Now, uh, so those are the... Um, all right, so uh, just obvious, my very trivial point, but uh, the Jacobi algorithm where you use these ro rotation is obviously also a kicked completely integrable Hamiltonian system as a trivial observation that a ro rotation, if you think of the angle as a time, then of course it's a completely integrable process, but that's a triviality, right? <laughs> So now I want to speak a little bit about what we now we said in the beginning we want to look at random situations so we want to apply these algorithms to different ensembles. So what are our choice of ensembles? So they were chosen for different reasons. So the first one is just GOE. How can we not look at GOE? And this we know has invariance properties. The next ensemble we, we want, to, the other ensembles we want to look at today which don't have invariance properties. So the simplest thing we could do is just uh, speak about IID Gaussian. Let me call this non-invariant. You remember here there's a relationship between what's happening on the diagonal and what's happening elsewhere. And so a mild variation which still d d destroys the invariance is just, okay. This is not your typical non-invariant one. The third one we looked at is Bernoulli. So that the entries are chosen as plus or minus one, and this introduces discrete ensembles. The fourth one we I introduced is we we'll call it Hermit one. So what you do here is you start off with a GOE matrix. You perform on your GOE matrix, so M belongs to GOE, you perform on that the householder transformation. And that turns, what the householder tra tra transformation does, it takes a matrix M, it converts it into a tridiagonal matrix with exactly the same spectrum and spectral distribution as these. So these are going to be matrices which have the same spectral distribution as G GOE, but they are tri tridiagonal. So what that means is that the algorithm should perform differently. <coughs> so 
So if you compare this and this, they have the same eigenvalue distribution. But this is a full, full matrix. This is a tri tridiagonal matrix. Does it make a difference when you apply? Okay. We also introduced all of these ensembles have uh, eigenvalue repulsion built in. So eigenvalue repulsion, which is a feature of all these kind, uh, kinds of ones. Then we picked on sums which did not have those properties. So that's five and six. Uh, I'm not going to do describe them in detail, just uh, say, say a little bit. This one is a uniform uh, stochastic, what, USDJ, UD, uniform. It says uniform doubly stochastic Jacobi matrices. I don't want to de de describe it in de de detail. And this is called a Jacobi uniform ensemble. I just want to give some idea about it is that Jacobi matrices are, can be mapped onto a set of numbers which are increasing, lambda 1, less than lambda 2, less than 3, across a point on the unit sphere in n, n dimensions, which is a, the first coordinate of the eigenvector. So there's such a mapping, so one-to-one one -one mapping. That means you can put any distribution now on eigenvalues and, eigenvalues and pull it back to, to the matrices. So the distribution we put on the eigenvalues is that they're uniformly distributed, Poisson, so there is no repulsion. Does that make a difference? So each of these is cho cho chosen to sort of test different parts of uh, on, uh, on sums. Okay, so as I say, what do we actually do or want to do? The key object is to look at this. T, epsilon, N, A, E of M. So what are these things? This is the tolerance you want, you want to know, so t is going to be a time. t is going to be the time at which, or the number of steps you need to achieve a deflation of order epsilon. n is going to be the size of the matrices. This is going to be your algorithm. Toda, QR, or QR with shift. And this is going to be your choice of ensemble. In other words, we want to pick epsilon and n, which is going to sit in some scaling region. Hopefully, we know that epsilon should be small and n should be large. We don't know what the right scaling region is. We just hope that we get into the scaling region. A is going to be one of these algorithms. You fix it, and then you pick your ensemble, GUE, uh, GOE, uh, etc. And then you pick a matrix from that ensemble. And T is the amount of time for that al al algorithm, a matrix chosen from that ensemble, to achieve deflation of size epsilon. Now we know that when you're doing this business, the object you should really look at is this object, which is this object taking away it's sample average. You center it, and you look at the sample standard deviation. So those are the objects again. So that's the centered and scaled um, deflation time. So then we begin looking at that. So I want to just show you what we obtained. What came up. Okay. So let me try and 
I, is there a pointer I could use so I don't stand in people's way? Yes, on the podium. Okay. And I switch it on by the, the red. Okay, there it is. So what you're looking here, these are four different ensembles. So each picture represents a different ensemble. The algorithm which we're going to use here is Q, QR. So if I go here, A is QQR, E are one of four different ensembles from this group, the re group which has repulsion built in. We call it generally the Wigner ensembles. And for each one of these curves, you're looking at 40 histograms plotted one on top of the other. Now, what are these 40 histograms? We've got to choose epsilon, we've got to choose n. So we choose epsilon to be four different values, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8. The size of the matrix starts from 10, goes up to 30, uh, goes 10 to 30 up to 190. So there are 10 uh, matrix sizes. There are four choices of epsilon. 10 times 4 is 40. And you plot the four histograms here. So this is the histogram for this normalized deflation time. So sitting over here, you look up here. That is the fraction which... Uh, has a deflation time of two and so on. This one is GOE. This one here is this Hermit one. This one over here is the non um, in, in invariant ensemble and this one here is the Bernoulli. So we put these all together And we end up with this picture. So now there were 40 plus 40 plus 40, 160 histograms. And here they all plotted one on top of the other. So one begins to get a sense that there's some universal behavior in the fluctuations. And we have a fixed al algorithm many different ensembles with many different kinds of properties. Some of these um, ensembles are discrete, others are con continuous. Nevertheless, you're seeing this picture emerging. This is a picture which, emerged, which is slightly different from, from this picture, and this is for these non-repulsion uh, ensembles. I don't want to say too, too much about it at this stage. Question. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, it, it, it's probably, it's <laughs> almost cer certain that we're on the generic leaf. I mean, the generic leaf is open and dense and has full, full measure. Mm -hmm. So it's almost certain that that's the case. Okay. So now, uh, okay. Uh, all right. All right, that's it. All right, so now I want, to, now we're changing algorithm. We're keeping the same on psalms, but now it's QR with shifts. Now, there are far fewer points here because the QR with shifts is just so effective. It converges in just a very few steps. So we had to make epsilon extreme, extremely small and it meant doing a lot more cal, uh, calculations so we couldn't get as, as many points but nevertheless I think you see this picture beginning to emerge so just saying again here each one of these is 40 uh, choices of epsilon and n a fixed algorithm which is QR with shifts and um, uh, we have one ensemble, a second ensemble, a third ensemble, a fourth ensemble and if you put them all onto one curve. Okay. Uh, what we see over here, just look at the curve on the, on the left. And this is a superposition of 160 histograms coming from very different 
kind, kinds of ensembles. Again, you see some kind. So the message is this. What seems to be the message coming out is that attached to each algorithm, there is a histogram. And that hi histogram is universal for a wide variety of choices of on, on, on song. Uh, it just to make the point a little more pre precise, what we begin to get the idea, at least from so far, is that when it comes to eigenvalue algorithm, there are two principal components. You adjust the average, you adjust the scale, and what emerges, what else emerges, is apparently universal. And there are different universality classes, and each algorithm gives you a different universality class. Okay, so now, next. Okay. I just want to show one more uh, for the TODA algorithm. Same story. 40, so the algorithm is fixed here. It's 40 histograms, 40 histograms, 40 histograms, all these different ensembles. You put them together. And you get the following picture. Again, look at the curve on the left. Again, you see the emergence of some curve for all these different ensembles. This is all using the to TODA algorithm, which means solving these differential equations, which I have uh, written down until you deflate to size epsilon. Yeah? So this is 